and welcome to this episode of For Your Consideration. Now, my name is Guy, and today we're looking at plants. Plants. What's up with plants? Well, plants are something that you can add to your game that is going to just elevate your setting to the next level. And we're going to look at these four different things throughout this video. That's why I put these titles up. They show you what's coming up, what you can expect. And then I've, as I talk through, they're going to unpack, hopefully, and show us what it's all about. Leave your comments below as to what you think of these, uh, by the way. And uh, we'll see if we're going to bring them back to the channel or not. It's entirely, entirely up to you, as a matter of fact. So let us know what you think in the video below. All right, back to plants, 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 plants. So plants give us a few things. They give us descriptive value. They give us practical value. Names give us a whole bunch of stuff. And then immersion is as a result of having this plant-based environment. Now, I had a viewer of the shows send me an Excel document containing hundreds of plants that they had worked out for their setting. It was an impressive amount of data on the plants that involved these four things, pretty much, um, and really described a whole new world that one could explore in. And all that it did, as I was reading this, I was going, you know, this is fantastic. Now, I have to confess, I have to confess, I am a little bit of a flower fanatic. I grew up in an environment where I was in the garden almost every other weekend and very much against my will being told to move the strelitzia next to the agapanthus and the frangipani has to be moved down there next to the water lilies and the clivias are only going to bloom in september so i grew up in an environment where flowers were very important to the people that were around me and as a result became very important to me and having wandered around Japan, where Hana, or Hana, the flower, it's Japanese for flower, is so prevalent and so beautiful and so luscious, I felt compelled to make this video. So you're going to have to bear with me. Flowers. Now, the descriptive value. <laughs> so, the descriptive value. It gives us a whole lot of things. Obviously, it's narrative. So it allows us to add this idea of flowers. You're walking through this field that's mixed with this profusion of yellow sunbursts with these deep orange trumpets and then these delicate white bursts of, of flower all over the place, punctuated by this evergreen grass that grows up and slowly the tips become yellow, creating this almost tiger-like effect as the wind moves through the grasses. It really gives you this amazing sense of narrative description which you can add to your arsenal as your characters are moving through. Now obviously you don't want to go overboard and describe every single tree, flower and plant that the characters happen to come across, but a few choice details here and there just makes the narrative feel richer and as if the characters are in a real world that exists in your head and so will start to exist in theirs. Obviously it brings flavour if you can talk about the Underdark having bioluminescent fungi as well as big black mushrooms which don't absorb light, they absorb darkness. All these kinds of things again just help to flavor your environment something that you can do is talk about how the starburst flower here in this particular part of the kingdom is seen as a good luck symbol but in another kingdom and on the other side of the planet is seen as the curse of death because the roots of the flower are particularly poisonous or whatever the case might be so by having a world map, you can work out roughly where your flowers are going to sit, because generally they grow in similar bands of temperature and climate and all that kind of wonderful stuff. And uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, reasons as to why humanity formed the way it did, based on the plants that grew in the specific regions and bands. So that is something that it can be certainly looked at. Now, uniqueness... Unique, uniqueness? Anyway, uniqueness is the idea of creating an environment that is special. So in my world of Braxia, I have these undead trees, which were cursed by druids long ago. And the trees basically grow like normal trees, but they literally will try to eat anything that walks past them. And the way that they do this is at night, they'll grow roots out of the ground that will impale into the neck of their victims. Or if their victims are a little bit too agile or aware, their roots will shoot up, up out of the ground and try to skewer anybody that they can causing those people to drip and leak down 
and their, their blood into the ground, which the trees then absorb. It's not a new idea. Mandrake root, that evil witch's device, came from the idea of the similar thing happening in uh, hanged men uh, who were uh, executed in that fashion. So it gives a uniqueness to an environment. So if that those undead trees, you will only encounter in this certain type of geography. My players by now start to recognize when they see certain plants, oh, we're in this area. The dew of the desert is a very specific type of plant, which is very rare in the great Sajet Desert of the campaign setting that I have. The dew of the desert is worth a fortune in gold because every morning, if it catches the first rays of sunlight as the sun rises up over the desert, it will ex exude a single drop of dew. That drop of dew acts as a healing potion which restores a vast amount of hit points to whoever who might drink it. And the plant continues to produce that dew for a period of several months throughout the year where it can be harvested, collected and saved. So there's a wonderful uniqueness value that plants can bring to your campaign. If we then look at the practical value, practical value of plants is everywhere. And even today in modern earth, we are still discovering advantages to plants. And so that's why we shouldn't cut down the Amazon rainforest. It's a good argument. It's a really good argument. Plants contain amazing things which we still don't know to this day. Can you imagine being a botanist, slowly discovering medicinal values of plants in the medieval era? Or go back even further to cavemen who discovered that chewing willow bark reduces toothache because willow bark contains aspirin. All those kinds of wonderful things are held within plants. So the practical values, you get mechanical effects. Now the mechanical effects are quite literally paralysis, death, healing, restoration, uh, relaxation, tripping, whatever the effect of the plant, there is a mechanical effect. There can be a mechanical effect. Dandelions, the roots of dandelions contain arsenic. So if you know how to get the arsenic out of the roots, you can prepare some very nasty poison. Almonds also used to contain arsenic, uh, etc, etc, etc. So again, this idea that we have this interesting mechanical effect coming out of the plants, fantastic. The story value is now particularly interesting because the story value is where a specific plant or a specific type of plant is required. In Lord of the Rings, it was Kingsfoil, Athlas flower, that was required to save Frodo. The little adventure that Sam had to go on was to find this particular type of flower. Sam's not, well, he was a gardener, so he should know what he's looking for, absolutely. But your standard adventuring party has to go out to find this very specific type of flower. It's now adding all of the above values plus more to your story. So flowers have a very strong value if you make them the center of the story. And of course, flowers and trees and all the other plants that go with it can be monsters. We've got a whole bunch in various monster manuals, monster textbooks. Even if you're in science fiction, plants have all of these values. Plus, they have the advantage in science fiction of being on completely different planets, so you can add even more. What about the fungi that float through space? If you look at the latest Star Trek show that's been released, Star Trek Discovery, mycelial spores, fungus, is spread out throughout the galaxy. That's an interesting take. I must admit, I as a diehard Trekkie go, oh, I don't know if I like that or not. But why not? Fungus grows everywhere. So why not take advantage of it? So it can be a monster. It can be something very practical. So plants bring us that great range of things. And how often have you used plants to deadly effect? Venus flytraps, fantastic idea. And yes, they exist in certain monsters' manuals, absolutely. Clinging vines, blood thorns, all kinds of weird and wonderful plants exist out there. And why not? We should make use of them. Now, when it comes to naming your plants, this can go a long way to helping with the previous two topics that I've spoken about, the descriptive value and the practical value. Naming plants, we've got three different ways of doing it. Three different ways of doing it. Obviously, we've got the regular way, so the regular type of name. So we might call it, let's say, uh, I don't know, a uh, lucky bean tree. There is such a thing because this little red bean, which is considered a lucky bean tree. 
it might have a historical name. And this particular name for this particular tree, I actually can't mention. It's legally offensive to a whole bunch of people. But it was given to that particular tree because that particular group of people was seen lying underneath it in the shade. So it became associated with that type of people. And the derogatory term that was used for that type of people was then applied to that type of tree. You can continue that in your campaign. Imagine if you had a tree called an orc slumber. Oh, that's an orc slumber growing over there. Oh, head on out over to the uh, goblin nose. Uh, you can't miss it. It's growing right over there on the side of the cliff. It looks like a goblin's great big nose leaking snot. It's disgusting. But that's the stuff you need to make coffee that'll keep you awake for weeks. So you can have a historical name to it. Again, all that this is doing is adding flavor, adding reality, if you like, to your imagined world. Regular names are just names that people would use on an everyday basis. And then, of course, you have your scientific names. Oh, the Adresarum infilii. Yes, we need to get that over to the laboratory quickly. Adding in scientific names, especially if you're in a science fiction kind of game, certainly adds a lot of gravitas to that space. It certainly makes like it feels as if it's a lot more alive and a lot more modern day. If you have a botanist, they're not going to say, uh, let's move the today, tomorrow and yesterday. Let's move that uh, indoors. No, 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 no. They're going to talk about the spirialum or the whatever they might need to come up with. I'm blanking at the moment, of course, because I'm, you know, on camera. But the idea is that you can use these three different ways of coming up with names to really flavor the plants that you are going to add to your campaign. Now, the immersion factor. This is where we start to utilize all of the stuff that we've put together into something that is then tangible for our players. Because it's important that the players, although that there's this wonderful descriptive world, and yeah, there's pretty flowers, and there's bad flowers, and there's good flowers, and blah, 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 blah. If they have a way of integrating it into their own character, into their own space, ah, now we're starting to get an immersive world. Now we're starting to get a place where the players are going to start jotting down the names of the different plants. They're going to start keeping track. Hang on, isn't that black? I thought that black, the black um, killer, I thought that had red flowers. No, 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 no. You're thinking of the red death. No, the black killer is black flowers with blue tints on. Ah, so we shouldn't be eating this then. No, we should. Uh, <laughs> whatever. So the herbalist within the party, whether that is a druid or a ranger, or it's somebody who might have nature knowledge or floral knowledge, what, however you want to describe it, whatever the system is that you're using. You can give them this information. You can say as you're walking along, oh, you see that lichen growing in the underside of the stones. You remember that if you were to gather that up, that will prevent rust on uh, metal. When you rub it into the metal, it creates this nice oil which will protect the metal from rusting. Ah, I will add that to my repertoire. The player's character has something to do. The player feels like they've had some value in that skill that they don't hardly ever use. And your world will feel as if it's complete. The healer, obviously, as you're traveling through, there's all sorts of things that the healer can pick up and discover and look at and learn. I will never forget one of the very first characters that I played in Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition, this must have been 1993 or 94, was a druid. And the GM was a particularly simulationist druid. We had run out of money. Uh, druid GM, simulated, simulationist GM. We had run out of money as a party and we really didn't have much option. The mage went off to go and produce their one cantrip spell and uh, their one spell a day. The fighter went to go and try and help the blacksmith, I think it was. And I went into the forest to try and gather herbs that I could then sell at market. That seems like a very boring environment, a very boring space. But the GM had good knowledge of plants and so described me finding staghorn, which I could go and cut down and use as a, I think it was a sedative, and I could find willow bark and I could find uh, marjoram and I could find this and I could find geranium for the smell and jasmine for the... 
they gave me this whole experience of discovering these plants so that later on when we were traveling and we'd solved our financial problems, I then made sure that my druid kept his eyes open for anything that they happened to pass whilst walking out in the fields. And that created such a wonderful experience for me. I still remember it today. It also links me quite nicely to my third point, which is when you are doing a travelogue, when your characters are moving from point A to point B, by having flowers that have practical value, by having flowers that have some kind of mechanical effect, that have some kind of relationship to the party members, travel becomes a lot more interesting. Now they can start to expect certain types of plants. They can start to react when those plants are missing. They can start to engage with their environment. All I have to do to point out the efficacy of this particular advantage is if you play any type of MMO these days where you have characters running around in these vast worlds, one of the things they do is they populate it with collectible plants so that your character runs up to the plant and goes, ha, I need 12 of these to create my leather jockstrap. Right, cut down the plant. Oh, and then I need 24 of these and I need 48 of that and I need 800 meters of square hide to create this one flimsy little outfit for the uh, female character because we're still stuck in that mode. Anyway, uh, that's another point. So the idea is that plants can add a tremendous amount of value to your game. Do not overlook the fruit salad. It has value. It really does. It often leads you to where the custard is. So that's my take on plants. Let me know your thoughts below. What do you think of these titles? Oh, got it wrong, finally. What do you think of these titles? Let us know, should we be continuing this moving forward or not? It rests entirely in your hands. Let us know. Until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of weekends.